connecting the behavior to the origin is kind of the first step. What's my depression about? Why do I have social anxiety? Why am I overworking? Why do I care so much about achievement? All of these problematic behaviors are really rooted in trauma that you're trying to push away. So I want people to make the connection. And then I want them to do is appreciate these behaviors instead of hate them. Today's guest is Dr. Frank Anderson, who's a Harvard trained psychiatrist, a world renowned trauma expert and author of To Be Loved, a story of truth, trauma and transformation. Dr. Anderson is known for helping people heal from the deepest wounds of trauma, but his journey began with confronting his own hidden scars from a childhood marked by pain and secrets. And that personal experience not only shaped his approach to trauma therapy, but also led him to become a global leader in integrating neuroscience with internal family systems. And in our conversation, we explore how facing his own story of truth and resilience helped him to build a life and a career dedicated to helping others transcend theirs. Let's dive in. So trauma is a really big word these days. Being triggered is a really big word these days. Uh, trauma-informed blank is a really big identification these days. Yeah. And um, and there's this quote that I, I you see circulating on, on social media from time to time. It says, it's not your fault that you have trauma or were traumatized, but it is your responsibility to heal from it. Yeah. And so can you, can you explain um, what trauma is as if I'm like a six year old, and then we're going to talk about what happened to you at six years old, but just give me that really simplified explanation. And then what is the first step to healing? If you, if someone's listening to this and they can identify with whatever your definition of trauma is. Yeah. So there's, you have like five questions in that one question. So I'm going to do my best to kind of unpack it all. I'll see if I remember. So I think about trauma. What is it? Like I think about frequency, intensity, and duration. Like how often does it happen? How intense was it? And how long does it last? Right. And trauma is what happens to you. Too many people identify trauma as an identity, like this is me. Like, no, 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 this is what happened to you. So there's an overwhelming experience in your life that happened to you. There's energy that you absorb that is not yours, that you carry as a result of something overwhelming, okay? What people struggle with is the response to trauma. It's what do you do with it? How do you respond to it? Those are the symptoms and the struggles that people have is their response to trauma. So I like to differentiate what it was that happened to you and how do you respond to it? Because those are very different things. This is where people get into trouble. This is what, how you kind of start unpacking your trauma is looking at your responses. Are you drinking? Are you yelling? Are you hitting your kids? Are you depressed? What are you doing in response to what happened to you? Because most people don't connect their behavior to their trauma. You know, I exercise a lot. What do you mean? That has nothing to do with my trauma, right? Or I'm, yeah, I I mean, whatever it is. I drink, I smoke. I, You know, they don't realize that the behaviors are actually a reaction and an adaptation to something traumatic. So the first- Even overachieving is- is 100%. Like- you didn't, you think I got to Harvard because it was fun? Like it was all a response to my trauma. Seriously, I'm going to be smart to be loved, right? I will do everything in my power. So overachieving, overexercising, all that stuff is a behavior that's and trying to protect you from something that you're trying to avoid. And so connecting the behavior to the, to the origin is kind of the first step. Like, wow, why is, why is my, what's my depression about? Why am I, why do I have social anxiety? Why am I overworking? You know, why do I care so much about achievement? Why am I finding all these unavailable people in my life? Like all of these problematic behaviors are really rooted in trauma that you're trying to push away. So I want people to make the connection. Oh, Like that's related to that, right? And then the other thing I want them to do is appreciate these behaviors instead of hate them. 
Oh, that's human, so right? A pre like suicide. Appreciate it. Right. Because and it's, suicide it's, is a symptom of it's like yeah. the most extreme symptom of depression. It's, it's not who you are. It's it's a symptom of the thing that you're navigating. And you know what usually suicidal feelings are? If it gets bad enough, I have an exit. Hmm. It's not it's you look at the positive intention. You know, right. and they see it just like people would see aspirin who have like severe yeah. migraine headaches. It's like, I just want yeah. to get relief immediately. That's, it's, it's relief. That's like that. That's over drinking, cutting, binging, all those things are attempts at keeping the pain away from the trauma that you experience. And I don't want people to be aware of that. It's interesting because, you know, we live on a trauma generating planet. I mean, that's, yeah. you can't get away from it. It's like trying I, to escape the sunlight or something like that. So yeah. you could make the argument that almost everything that we do that, that defines our personality traits and things like that are, are partially at least uh, extensions yeah. of that, that childhood trauma, right? Which I is why it. when you go to the therapist, the first thing they want to talk about before they get into why your partner's a narcissist is tell me about <laughs> your, your upbringing. That's Tell exactly. me about what happened when you were six years old, when you were got caught exactly. playing with Barbie dolls in the basement. You, <laughs> you know, your cousin house. Right? That's 100%. Yeah, people aren't aware of that. I kind of think that this is why we're here, is to experience adversity and to grow and evolve from it. Now, everybody doesn't choose to grow, right? But I think, like you said, everybody has adversity in one way or another. Nobody's free of it. And I think there's a purpose for that. I think that's kind of why we're here on earth is to learn from our experiences. And we, we can learn so much more from difficult experiences than from po positive experiences. I mean, let's be grateful for the life we have and learn. I kind of think about when I wrote this book, the moments that made me, that's what I kept saying. The moments that made me, some of them were small, some of them were big but they're, they were all significant moments that it's like, what am I going to do with this, right? What am I going to do with this moment? So that that's the way I think about it. We're all here to learn from our moments. Okay, so let's start with your story, right? But we're going to go back. I've never done this before. But we're going to go yeah. back to the in-between life, okay? Assuming that there is an in-between life <laughs> and that you are playing a role in the <laughs> formation of the perfect scenario for you to start to do the kind of work that you're doing now. You need to have this kind of father. You need to yep. have this kind of mother. You yep. need to have this, these kind of siblings. You need to grow up in this kind of environment. So what, what kind of scenario would you create for yourself to have the gift of those experiences that are going to allow you to help so many other people recognize, identify, and, and potentially heal from their trauma? So it's interesting. I spent many years being angry and hating my father and hating my mother for all the ways they did me wrong, right? And we can talk about all those details. And the reality is that that was the family I chose for the life that I have. Now I know mm -hmm. this was the perfect father for me and that was the perfect mother for me. And honestly, now I wouldn't change it. Like I went through a lot. It was a difficult childhood for sure, but I wouldn't be talking to you here right now had right. I not gone through what I've gone through, you know? So this is the life I believe on a soul level, this is the life I chose so that I can learn what I need to learn to help heal trauma in the world. I know trauma, not like, oh, this is so cool and lofty and intellectual. I know it from the inside out, right? And I could speak as a, a uh, psychiatrist and as a survivor, you know, I do lectures, I've written books and I've lived it personally. So I think that does make me somewhat unique in this kind of credibility mm -hmm. to be able to talk about healing. It's not theoretical for me. It's real. And I lived it and I devoted my whole life, my professional life to it. You know what I mean? So I, I'm, I don't have regrets at this point. I tell you, I don't. Yeah. It makes you relatable. And you, you wrote that, um, people ask you, how do you manage to do so much? You're taking <laughs> on all these creative projects. You've written several books, yeah. right? 
And, uh, and I've, I read the, you know, you, I like to read the blurbs in people's books just yeah. to see like who else is paying attention to this person. And you yeah. obviously know all the trauma people in the world, the highest <laughs> level, you know, <laughs> stress yeah. and trauma people. And so yeah. that means you are probably, you know, traveling around to these conferences and oh, meeting yeah. all these people. And, yeah. and then you're teaching or training thousands of people in how to, how to help other people navigate yeah. their trauma. So you said that thanks to the quick reflexes that you developed as a kid, avoiding your father's rage. So can you give us some specific examples of what you're referring to when you say your, your father's rage? And you also mentioned your mother's passivity. So just talk a little bit about the, that, that dynamic and some of the, some of the maybe the ideologies that you that they echoed to you and your siblings growing up. Yeah. So, you know, as a kid, when I was six years old and my parents say to me, when you're not going to school today, Frankie, mm -hmm. and they send me for psych testing because I got caught playing with my cousin Barbie Playhouse in the basement. So that's kind of how this trajectory starts from our perspective. Right. And I don't know what's going on. I'm a six year old kid and I get sent to therapy for six years to be a normal boy. Like it was a form of conversion therapy. Like I didn't get sent away, but I, my mom will say it today. We sent you, there was a form of conversion therapy. Like these are the toys you play with. You don't play with these things. Like I mean, there's a whole brainwashing. Right. So there's that layer of you're wrong. Like there is something wrong with you. You're broken, you're bad. Like I always had that message, right? And then, and then on top of that, my dad was like raging and out of control in a moment's notice. Like it's the look in his eye. If I said or did the wrong thing, he, it was like, I think one of the lines I say is, I became prey and he became predator, boom. And if I said the wrong thing, and you know, I spoke up a lot. I, I was like, this isn't right. I don't agree with this. Like I was that kind of kid. And boy, did the world it. doesn't revolve around you, Frankie. The world doesn't revolve <laughs> around you, Frankie. And he would chase me around the house, like chase me around the house. And I feared for my life hundreds of times, you know? And it was like this, you cocksucking motherfucking son of a bitch. You're a goddamn paranoid schizophrenic. Like a lot, you know, and I'd be running up the stairs, running around the couch, running into my bedroom, locking the bedroom door and watching the hinges move on that bedroom door. Like if he knocks down that door, I'm screwed, right? Over and over and over again. And it was terrible. Like it was terrifying. It was really terrifying. I didn't know what the hell was going on, but I was wrong. Like there was something really wrong with me. Why would your father do this to you if it's not about you? Because he never said, oh, my God, I'm sorry. It's my fault. I shouldn't. I'm out of control. Maybe I'm bipolar. Maybe I'm an alcoholic. Like, never said that, right? Didn't take responsibility. So I did for all of it, you know. And then the, the, the flip side of this was my mom's dependency on him. She needed him because of her upbringing more than she could protect me, right? So she would constantly come into my room after he'd like do one of his things and then tell me how much he loved me and tell me how important the family was. And Frankie, 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 I promise you, I won't say anything like she needed me to stop it, forgive him. And keep him as a husband. You know, she needed that. Fa she I, in, in the times to give her credit, like women couldn't kind of get divorced and live on their own so easily. She and she grew up without a father. Her father died when she was six months old. So she kind of used my dad as like a father and a husband. And she needed him. And she served me up. You know, it's the way it's, it's the way it felt. I love my mom. I love my dad, you know, now. Um, but boy, it was confusing growing up and I did not understand what was going on. I just knew there was something wrong with me. Were your three siblings um, also having the same experience? No, that was one of the things that was confusing for me. That was part of the me. Like my brother, Ross, who's two years younger than me, 
talk about traumatic bonding. Like him and RA were the clo are so close, like so close. He was like my savior when I was a kid. He was two years younger than me. He helped me through my nightmares all the time, my bedwetting, all the stuff. He was always there for me. Did you guys share a room? We shared a bedroom. We were in our twin beds right across from each other, like loved my brother. And we couldn't be more different, honestly. Like we couldn't be more different. Like he lives in Mississippi. He loves hunting, you know, like he's a cigar smoking dude. You know, like I am so different, but we love each other like beyond anything, right? We are so close and so connected. So he didn't, he got hit sometimes, but not to the same degree that I did. You know, I don't, that was another like, why me, right? Probably, yeah, my, my dad really had it out for me. My brother, it wasn't like my brother was treated like an angel, but he did not get it to the same degree. And he would say, he'll say that. My sisters who were six and seven years younger, almost like they lived in a different family. Like my younger sister read the book and she's like, I had no idea this was happening. Like this was not the family I grew up in. Like she doesn't remember that because what ended up happening when I went to therapy at six years old for seven years, my parents went to couples therapy. And so there was a lot of rules and changes in the house. No more hitting. We ground you instead of hitting you now. So they'd send us up to our room to be grounded. So like my sisters didn't grow up with as much violence in the house as I did and my brother, cause it was like they were younger and my dad was different. He was better by then. Yeah. I grew up in, in the South. I have three siblings and, uh, mm -hmm. in, in the seventies. So we got, we got spanked. I got the most spankings. Did you? I didn't know. I, yeah. I, I didn't really understand that. And now I get my mom was very, she was a very young mother and she had a lot of unmanaged, unprocessed stress, yeah. you know, and she would yeah. just snap. So yeah. it sounds like we kind of had similar type of, of situations. Exactly. Happening That's there. Good. Yeah. Um, so you've been in therapy ever since you were, or you started therapy when you, since you were six years old, right? Yeah. And I'm always fascinated when I read a memoir especially one like yours, when it's so detailed. And I know that stressful emotion makes you remember things vividly. Yeah. Right. So just talk a little bit about that process. How, how did you call together these memories, these earlier memories? Do, like literally, like from a writer's perspective, what was your process like? Were you going through old photos and then it, it would trigger a memory about something or what? It's a, what great, it? it's a great question. Nobody's really asked me that before. So I love that question. Like what trauma does is this, it, you, you disconnect from many memories for survival and you hyper-focus on others as a mm -hmm. way to kind of survive, right? So it's this combination of repressing and hyper-focusing on details, like the hinges on the door. I focused on the hinges on the door because they were literally moving when he would bang on the door and scream all that stuff. So it was a hyper-focus on the hinges. And then there was this like a lot of, I don't remember, I don't remember. There was a, I had a lot of pushing memories away. And it wasn't until I was in my residency training program many years later that I started working with people with mental illness issues. The residency program that I was in, you had to be homeless with no insurance in order to get into the hospital. So it was a public hospital. There was so much trauma that all these people had. And when I started talking to them, my stuff started bubbling up. So it's like all these repressed memories started coming up. When I was in therapy during my residency, 10 years for seven, seven five days a week, right? They deep dive. And that's where all this stuff started coming up. But I'll tell you, when I wrote the memoir, I wrote three versions. Okay. The first version was writing, telling the story, Frank now telling the story. And my husband was like, yeah, this is kind of missing something. It's, you know, it's missing something. It's kind of an interesting story. And so then I wrote the whole thing from the kid perspective. I wrote the whole story, like I'm in the closet. 
I'm being beaten. I, like I wrote the whole story from the me living the trauma perspective. And that was very intense to do that. There was a lot of reliving all of it. Like I was just in the scene and trying to let people know what every moment was like. And then I put the two versions together and, you know, you kind of move in and out of my life now and my life then and my life now and my life then. Cause I wanted people to have the immediacy of it, but I didn't want to traumatize everyone. Do you know what I mean? So that's how I wrote it. And I, I'm happy with the way it turned out because you can be there with me, but you can also know that like I survived and thriving and I healed from it. Do you know what I mean? It's kind of mm -hmm. both. Hey, so a lot of you all have been reaching out with your guest suggestions and look, I appreciate it. I do. And to help make it easier for those guests to say yes to my invitation, I need you to subscribe to this channel. Just hit the subscribe button below, and that's literally the best way to help me get you that guest on my podcast. All right. Thank you so much for helping out and back to the show. So you dedicated the book to your dad and your two sons, and you called them your greatest teachers. Yeah. What did you learn from your dad? Obviously, you said you grew up hating him for many, many years. So now on, that you're on the other side of that healing that you just mentioned, what were the, the lessons that you learned from, from those younger years? Yeah, so I learned a tenacity, uh, a drive from my dad. I also learned at the end of his life about love and forgiveness. So those were very powerful lessons for me as a kid. Um, him and I are very alike. He worked, he loved his work. He worked like crazy. You know, he was passionate about helping people. So we had a lot of similarities. Um, I learned a lot about family values from him, the love of family, even though he also had this like violent out of control temper for my kids. Honestly, I've learned more than anything from anybody because they have been my biggest teachers, separate from learning about trauma and healing from my father. You know, as I had kids, I started expressing some of the feelings in a way that was done to me for my dad. Like when you're traumatized, you absorb trauma energy and you absorb perpetrator energy. So I had that energy in me and I, it started getting expressed with my kids when they were younger, when they would fight, when they were out of control, I yelled at them to stop their behavior because it triggered me. Right. And when I saw myself doing what was done to me, I was like, I'd rather be dead. Like I would rather be dead than to perpetuate this trauma. And it's the, then I got into therapy a third round. That was my third round of getting into therapy. I am going to heal this. I am going to stop this transgenerational pattern. And it's the last thing I do, because honestly, I would rather be dead than to just re-traumatize my kids in the way that I was traumatized. I had kids to give them everything I didn't have, not to give them everything I did go through, you know? And so they motivated me to really um, do it differently and not repeat those patterns. You mentioned that Grandpa Ross would say over and over, education is the most important thing. Yeah. Your dad would say, the smarter you are, the luckier you become. Do you yeah. still agree with those based on your experiences and talking about transgenerational messaging? Well, I do not. <laughs> What's I the most important thing in your, in your uh, opinion? Most important thing regards to what? Raising kids or? Just like whatever, what, why, the reasons why they were saying those things, whatever they were witnessing and saying, I need to let, I need to remind this kid this is what he needs to be paying attention to. So was, what, what would you be reminding your boys? Yeah. This so you need to be paying attention to. And, and so that was the immigrant mentality. My grandfather, my grandmother came over from Italy and this was this immigrant mentality. Education is everything. This is what's going to make you successful in the world. And boy, did my dad and everybody took that to heart. And I dove into education. Like it was everything. Right. I don't do that with my kids. Like I have two boys, one now I'm, I'm, supporting him in becoming a race car driver, my oldest. 
He's like an F1 race car driver? He is going to F1 racing school in <laughs> February. I wow. swear to God. I am so excited for him. Him and I went to Austin, Texas recently for the formula for the F1 race in Austin, Texas. Like he's passionate about cars. He is not a, he hates school. He's not his thing. And I am like, I am going to support your passion no matter what it is. Right. And I feel so good about that. And it is not about education for him. This is a passion about cars. It's like support your passion. Be seen. Right. Be seen. I see him and he feels so grateful for that. And, you know, my youngest is on the autism spectrum and super challenging kid. He's been super challenging and loving him for who he is, not getting the world, not getting him to fit into the world. It's more getting the world to fit with him. Is he you know? functioning as is like, is yeah, he he's he goes to school. He's in a therapeutic school. He goes to school. He's a super smart kid. He's very musically inclined, you know, and it really was, there was a lot of years earlier on where it was like, get him to fit into society and culture. And I had this one moment. I was like, excuse me. I'm like, fuck that. I am not getting him to fit into this world. The world needs to get to understand who this kid is. So that was an important, that was a turning point for me around trying to make this kid something other than he is. Like it doesn't work, you know, uh, and he's doing super well. Like he's, he's got strands online. He does virtual reality and he has this whole life, you know, that's kind of the way that it works for him. So that's super important to me. Like I feel my parents never, it took a, my parents a long time to accept who I was. I'm like, I'm not going to wait 32 years for me to accept who my kids really are. You know, I had seven years of no contact with my parents because they could not and would not hear me and see me. And so I disconnected from them. It's like, if I, you know, I wasn't strong enough to stand up to them. And I, yeah, I couldn't take their denial around nothing's wrong. How dare you? Nothing happened. So seven years of no contact and it was important and useful, I think, for all of us. It made them like, oh, gosh, we don't have control over this kid and he's going to be who he is. And if we want him in our life, we have to accept him for who he is. I feel like so many people are experiencing that. I mean, I, yeah. I, I oftentimes put a lot of content out about, you know, spiritual stuff and looking at things from yeah. a spiritual perspective and yeah. people always say, well, what about family? I can't, my family doesn't honor my boundaries and blah, blah, blah. So maybe now that you've, you've had that experience of seven years of no contact and, and then you were back in touch and you had this really wonderful healing experience yeah. with your dad before he passed away. Yeah. I guess looking back now, is there anything you would do differently or what is sort of a playbook for yes. navigating that in a way that everybody gets what they need out of it, right? Because you can't force people to accept you. So one of the things I'm doing right now, Light, is I'm, I'm reworking trauma therapy. I think we have a ways to go, okay? I was, I've been in therapy for 35 years. I don't recommend that, and I don't think that's required for everyone to heal trauma. I think we can do better. And I think there's not enough therapists to go around with how much trauma there is. So what I would do better, and this is part of what I learned in my life, is, is identify a problematic behavior, work on it, make your life different, and then go back and do another piece of work. Like It's like if you want to work on your anger, focus on your anger. Learn about your anger. Journal about your anger. Find out the roots of your anger. And live your life and see if you can live your life in a different way with anger. Like we need to go back and visit our history, but we also need to do it differently in our present day life. Both are necessary. And therapy doesn't talk about forward. It only talks about back. Coaching talks more about forward than going back. <laughs> and I'm like, we need to do both. So I would like do a piece of work, live your life, have experiences, make changes, then go back and do another piece of work, you know, learn about the origins and live your life differently. It's kind of, that's what I'm kind of creating at this new model of therapy is 
is I, I, cause one of the things I was in therapy for so long and I couldn't have done the healing I did without interacting with my father. Like when he was at the end of his life, part of what was so healing was interacting with him, but I had to be strong enough to interact with him. And he was weaker and fail, like frail. So he wasn't like yelling and screaming and attacking me. Do you know what I mean? So I'm not mm -hmm. saying go in dangerous situations. I, and that's not what I'm suggesting. I'm suggesting get yourself strong enough and, and have corrective experiences in your life. Because finding out the history is important, but doing it differently is also important. And I want people to kind of do this, learn a bit, bit have make changes, learn a bit, make changes. That's, I wanted, that's my pa passion right now. That's my next book is how to bring trauma healing to the world, not just to psychotherapy offices, you know, because I, I think there's so much trauma and there's, there's a better way to do it. You know, I'm going to do what I can to help people do it differently. What, what I'm hearing is, and I could be incorrect about this, so you can you can help massage this this concept. But the practice is it boils down to depersonalizing the experiences and understanding that it wasn't really something wrong with you, and that's really where people get stuck in in the disassociative patterns and stuff that happen as a result of the trauma. And so, the healing process is really about sort of re. Um, it's about exposing yourself to new ideas about who and what you, you truly are and what's possible for you. Here's the thing. This is when I when and I some of neuroscience knowledge helps me with this understanding. So the what the core components of healing from my perspective is visit your history. Don't get stuck there. Visit. Don't get stuck. The part that holds the trauma needs to share its experience because it holds something important. It needs to share it, not just the story, the thoughts, the feelings, the physical sensations. So when you go back and visit your trauma, you as an adult now need to hear what the younger part of you experienced fully. Thoughts, feelings, physical sensations. So there's a sharing component that's necessary. There's a corrective experience needs to happen. You have to have the opposite of your trauma. Like if you were uh, you were unloved, feel loved. If you were never seen, feel seen. If you were feel neglected, you need to feel important. You need to have a corrective experience. That's in your life, right? That could be anywhere in any relationship. So have a corrective experience opposite of your trauma. And once you've shared and once you've had that corrective experience, then you can let go of what you're holding. Then you can release it. And there's there's science to back this, which is important. So uh, there's a way that I keep releasing what I'm carrying, going over this process over and over and over again, right? And that's the way I want, I want to teach people how to do that. Sometimes you need a therapist and sometimes you could do journaling. You know, there's a lot of different ways to do it. How did you know it was time to reconnect with your parents and um, and then how did you approach that final conversation with your dad? Because, mm -hmm. you know, a lot of people, they take these personal development courses on the weekend yeah. and <laughs> they call up people and they say, I forgive you. And I just always feel like that's a very harsh thing to do to someone because <laughs> they're like, what are you talking about? I didn't do anything. Right? <laughs> Everybody thinks they're doing the best they can. Yes. So how, do you, how do you approach those kinds of really open and vulnerable healing conversations? Well, I do. So a couple things about it. I, I re-entered with my parents and my dad after that period of time, because I wanted to start a family. My husband and I were going to have a kid and I wanted my kids to know their family. I wanted them to know their origin and I wanted them to know these people that were important to me in my life also. Right. So that was a part of why I reconnected and I was strong enough to withstand their pushback. I had done enough of my own work. I'm like, you can think whatever you want. I know what happened to me. I don't care what you think about it. I know what happened. The forgiveness piece, I say the F word, that's a that's a tricky one, right? It's just, some people force it so prematurely. Forgive, forgive, forget. Like it doesn't work. Just saying those words doesn't work. 
I believe you need to heal your trauma first before you can forgive. I think you need to heal what happened to you before you choose to forgive somebody who harmed you. And what does that healing look like? Just what I explained, sharing the experience, having a corrective experience, releasing the trauma. Like I'm not carrying my trauma anymore. I'm not, it's, it's what happened to me, not who I am, right? I've released all that stuff. And once you do that, then you could decide or not to forgive this person who harmed you. Because once you heal your trauma and you're not carrying the anger and resentment and the, the hurt, you see the humanity in your perpetrator more. Mm. You can say, can I said, like, this is a frail man. He had his faults too. My dad was a human being. In some ways he tried his best and in other ways he failed miserably. Like he's complicated just like we all are. So I was able to see him more realistically without carrying all the hurt, anger, and resentment, right? And seeing him that way made me feel better about myself. I was like, I can love you no matter what you did to me. And that was the ultimate rising above it all. Even if you hurt me badly, I can love you. I'm not affected by it anymore. I'm free. Because when you love somebody who harmed you, if it's genuine, you're not passive or accommodating them. You're rising above it all. I felt like I rose above it all. And the other thing that surprised me, shocked me really, was forgiving him allowed me to forgive myself. Because then I was able to, you can't really let yourself off the hook if you're holding someone accountable for something. Like when I, when I really let go of all that he did and we exchanged love at the end of his life, that was another thing. We exchanged love. You know, the last words he said to me were so powerful. You know, um, I wasn't the father you needed and wanted, but I always loved you. You know, that was honestly the first time I felt love from him. Mm. I felt it. And then it was easier to feel love for him, you know? So I know everybody doesn't get those. Experience. That was a gift. That was a true gift for me. Um, and it freed me. It freed me from carrying the stuff I carried, you know, and not in a way that therapy didn't. <laughs> therapy helped. Don't get me wrong. I was so much stronger to show up in that moment because of all the work I had done. I wouldn't have been able to show up. I would have been too angry and hurt and resentful and I couldn't take it in. Mm -hmm. But I had done enough work on my own to be able to really take advantage of that moment and release so much hurt and your resentment. And, you know, created, gave him a funeral and was loving and kind and, did all the stuff and I felt really good about it. Felt really good about it because I wasn't affected. I wasn't affected anymore. And that's freeing. Like forgiveness is for the person doing the forgiving, not for the person being forgiven. That's my experience. Like I benefited from forgiving him because I wasn't caring that anymore. Did he benefit? Maybe. I don't, I don't really know. But it was good for me to forgive him. How could yeah, and like going back to our hypothetical scenario yeah. of the life in between lives, you know, yes, it, it 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 seems like you need it. You needed that. I don't say that. I don't use that word lightly. But you needed to go through all of that in order yeah. for you to find your path and your purpose. Yes, and a part of the healing process is also making yourself useful in helping other people yes. sort of navigate that maybe even before you finally get to that point of complete healing, yeah. maybe that's like the final step, right? You got to start helping other people service. Well, service, service. This is what I think, you know, I wrote after I wrote, I think if a lot of people help others prematurely caregivers, caregivers care. Well, let me help you so that I don't have to deal with my own. Let me help you so I can focus on yours instead of me. 
So a lot of people do that. Most therapists do that to tell you the truth. Yeah. I mean, you know, so how do you know? Okay. So if you're a therapist or wanting to be in the therapist, how do you know when you're ready? What's, what's yeah. the sign that, okay, I've built, been through my shit. How do I know I'm ready to help somebody else? through their it's, I think it's simultaneous. Like nobody's ever done. I'm never going to be done healing. Never mm -hmm. going to be done. Sorry. Never. Um, so you keep, you work on your shit while you're helping others. Like it can be a both and it doesn't have to be, I'm all done and I'm all healed. And now I can start helping. Right. But there's stages, just like stages of grief. So which yeah. stage should you be at in order to properly be useful? That you're not helping your help. Here's the thing for me, you're helping others in the services of keeping yours at bay mm -hmm. is premature. When you're helping others from a place of love and service, it's a different thing. Right. So it's from where does it, where is the helping coming from is the way I want to think about it. Is there a driven, I have to help so I can feel better about myself. That's not the best kind of helping. It's, you know what, I'm going to do as much as I can to help others and let's see what happens. Right. And what I've found is after my second book, Transcending Trauma, I got a message it's like, you need to bring trauma healing to the world. I did not understand what the hell that meant. I didn't need Me? I got the right guy? Like, really? You know? And what I learned is the more I gave from my heart to help, the more I start receiving. Stuff shows up. I cannot believe this is my life. I cannot believe it. And you're nodding in a way that I can tell you know what I'm talking about. Like I could feel that from you, right? So there's a there's a on there's a a freedom of giving and helping. It's unattached. It's from the heart, and it's pure. And that that giving, that service, is what shows up to you in return. That's been my experience. When I give to get, I don't really get, right? When I give to give, stuff shows up in the weirdest ways. It's got to be pure, not attached to something. I guess that's a, a way I would say it. It's taken me a while to learn that lesson, but it's a much better way to live for me now. Quincy Jones, who just passed away, rest in peace, yeah. he said, um, if you make whatever you're doing about the money, God walks out of the room. And I just right. love that. Hunter Christoph, that's exactly right. That fame, fortune, mm -hmm. all the wrong reasons. Like the energy of giving unencumbered is like free. So there's, there's stuff that can freely come back. When it's attached, there's an, a, a counter force attached to it. And it yeah. pre prevents it from happening. Like, this is another thing I think. When you want something too bad, it ain't going to happen. Because the energy of want has a counter energy pushing against it. When you try and let go, then there's room for things to show up. That's been a hard lesson, but I'm getting much better at it. Why is it so hard for men in general to embrace therapy because you know when when you talk about you know healing the healing process i feel like men in general again there are exceptions but men in general we kind of default to self diagnosis whereas women you know it's like it's helpful to get an object objective perspective on the things you're saying how you're saying it what you're not saying all of those things tell a story, but I feel like men, or let me ask you this. Do men and women therapize? Is that a word? Therapize? Do they, do they and make it work. the therapeutic process differently? Is there something about the brain of the man that makes them respond or, or experience it differently? I think, I think it's two factors. I think there's a brain piece. I think testosterone is an evil chemical. <laughs> testosterone is very different than estrogen. Okay. Estrogen is a chemical of connection. Testosterone is a chemical of winning. 
right? So I think there's a biological thing within us that's that's the wild estrogen and testosterone, you know? So it's we're hardwired and we're socialized. And we're socialized. You know, there's a lot of studies that show that boys lose their voices much sooner than girls do. Boys lose their voice at eight. Girls lose their voice at 14, 12 to 14. You know, we're tough. Be tough. Be strong. Don't be a, don't be a sissy. Don't cry. Ugh. Like, you know, we're constantly told to be tough and strong and not feel. Brush it off. Get back on the field. All the things. That's culture, right? And women are, are not don't have those kind of standards. They have different. You're bad and you're wrong if you're not thin and pretty and beautiful, right? And so women have a whole different thing that they're dealing with. And women tend to internalize. Men tend to externalize. So women are much more likely to be depressed. I'm bad, I'm wrong, get depressed and withdraw. And men are like to, more likely to get depressed and fight. You know what I mean? Get into a bar fight or whatever. So we are wired differently and society and culture treats us differently. So it's a, for me, it's both that contribute to these differences. Okay. And um, a through line in your book is about your, you, you reveal your sort of coming out process and it kind of started. I don't know if you knew you were different when you were six, when you were playing with those Barbie dolls. Not at all. Barbie I was Barbie being too. who I thought I was. I had right. no awareness. No. And then there was the college incident of the guy in the bathroom. And then, you know, it, come, it culminates in you coming out in a therapy session with your wife. <laughs> How perfect is that? <laughs> so just talk, give us a little montage of, of all of that and kind of where, how, how did that, how did that coming out? Cause I just got out of a relationship and I had some like this, this thing on my chest that was bothering me just came out of the blue, right? Got out of the relationship two months later, it completely went away. I'm back to like normal. I don't know if it's related, but maybe, maybe so maybe there's, maybe there could, probably. You know, Maybe probably. <laughs> Maybe probably. So did you have any any of the healing happen as a result of, of hiding that identity from your, it from your partner? It takes a lot of energy to suppress things. It takes a lot of energy to forget things. It takes a lot of energy to push things away. I'll just say that. And what would happen, like, when I was in college, and it really was, like, I grew up in the Midwest in a conservative family. Like, I didn't know gay. I didn't even know what the word meant. I had no exposure. And you know, I'm in college and I'm studying biochemistry with my then girlfriend who became my wife. And I go to the bathroom and yeah, it's like 11 o'clock or 12 o'clock at night. And some guy is like in the stall next to me, exposing himself and masturbating. I was freaked out. I didn't know what the hell was going on. He was cruising in a bathroom. It, it shocked me. And it was this like, I was confused, but I was this excitement and desire popped up in me and then i freaked out and pushed it away that's what ended up happening like, <gasps> oh my god like i had sp I like spontaneous orgasm sit you know like sitting in a, it was crazy like it was this bubble this desire bubbled up for me right and i was like holy crap i had never had a wet dream my whole life because i was my trauma just suppressed all of those fantasy feelings so it scared the crap out of me and I pushed it away, you know, pushed, no, 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 no. And, and I had this history of you better be this way, you better be this way, right? I had this history of this is how men are supposed to be. And then it happened again. I was running while my wife, then wife was on call. I went out for a run and another guy cruised me, popped up again. It's like, holy shit, what is this? What is this? And the second time it popped up, I couldn't push it away as easily because it was getting kind of too big in a way for me to push away. And then I started cheating on her. I went to cruising areas and I started cheating on her for about six months or so, not knowing what the hell was going on. And still like, this can't be true. This can't be true. I will lose my whole family if I come out. By then I knew what gay was, but I knew I couldn't be that because I would lose my whole family. So pushed it away, pushed it away in therapy and therapy and therapy, right? Um, so finally, it was a tipping point. It became a tipping point. It was like, I cannot let this lie anymore. 
Like it was that moment for me that I told her in our couples therapy, it was like, I'm more important than my family. I'm more important to me than my family is. And I chose myself over my family. And I didn't tell my dad, my mom and dad for two years. I was in living in Boston. They were in Chicago. Told my brother, you know, of course I told my brother. He was one of the first people I told, you know. He just loved me no matter what. Didn't matter. So, yeah, there was that. It was a process. It didn't happen overnight. I'd get these moments of panic and then I'd push it away. Moments of panic and push it away. And then at some point, I couldn't push it away anymore. You know, I couldn't push it away. And, and again, like I became more important. This is the second time in my life writing this memoir where, and I said this to my mom, like my story and my truth is more important than my relationship with you. I care about me more than I care about staying connected with you. If you can't accept my truth, I love you. I care about you. I want you in my life. But if you can't love me, accept me and love your husband, that's on you. I love you. I care about you. I need my truth to be told also. I didn't need to choose and I didn't want her to choose. But what I said is I'm not choosing you over my truth. And she refused to read the book, right? Yep. She refused she, to read. She thought you were demean, or belittling the family and exactly. misrepresenting your dad. And She didn't talk to me for months after the book was released. And we now are back. We're kind of finding our way back to each other. But I, I didn't need that separation. She did. And look, I understand, like, I wrote a memoir. And I exposed a lot of things about her and my dad that she didn't want being exposed. So I, I can really understand that. I do, I do, but I, I couldn't, my truth was important for me. And I changed names and changed details. I did everything I could to protect people. You know, I did, you know, but um, I wasn't gonna sacrifice myself for her anymore. And that's a big statement to say. Yeah, I mean, it's interesting writing a book. I've written a few books. I've never written, written a memoir, but I've definitely told some stories. And uh, they say that specific and honest is universal. And so as an author, you know, you're going to spend the time writing. You may as well really go in and, and be as honest as possible. And I don't think people who haven't written a book can appreciate that. It, you much. know what? I'd have these moments like it, it's a very raw book. <laughs> like, mm -hmm. no, no, like, But I'd have these moments like... Am I going to really say this? And then I'd get this calm that came over me. It's like, it's the truth. You're not going to get hurt with the truth. Right? And I didn't hold shame around it because I've done so, so much healing. So it's a truth without shame, right? Because shame is really a, a truth killer in a way, right? So, yeah, I just kept like, oh, my God, I can't believe I'm putting this out there. And I don't, I don't feel bad about it. And you know what? Nobody has said anything harmful to me. They're like, thank you for being so honest. Like nobody's trashing me for telling my truth. Like, it kind of doesn't work that way. Yeah. I, I don't even know if, if are, are people still hiding the fact that they're gay these days? Is that still yeah. a thing? Or? It's still, there's still <laughs> high suicide rates in gay and transgendered communities. Like even though the world is so much more accepting, yeah, these kid, poor kids are still struggling with it. You know, depending on what part of the country you live in, it's somewhat easier. California and Massachusetts are very different than living in like Mississippi or Louisiana, you know, so it's different. Yeah, it's not it's not a non-deal. It's, it's still an issue, you know. So let's say one person is listening to this and they don't want to do that anymore. What's the playbook? You know, find safe people. And be your be yourself. Like safety is important. There's Trevor Project. There's organizations. There's there's organizations in your community that are safe spaces because you can't really expose yourself and your trauma when you're actively being hurt. So you've got to be in some level of safety. This is what happens with some of these poor kids. 
who are growing up in these areas that are totally unsafe, it's not until they get out of the house that it's safe enough to be themselves if they're in college or whatever. So you've got to pay attention to safety if you're going to reveal yourself in a way that could potentially be harmful. I mean, people, there are hate crimes that exist in this certain parts of the world more than others, you know? So, um, and, and it's going to get better. Like, that's the thing I would say to anybody out there. It can, it will get better. Like I could not imagine a life being a gay person in the world. And here I have a husband and two kids and I'm thriving. You know, and it was not always that way for a long time for me. When I was a kid, gay was a mental disorder. It's not anymore. And if you're on the receiving end of someone uh, revealing something, well, what should you not do or say? You should only listen and validate. This is what I would say. There's no, let me give you advice. There's no. I, my, one of my best friends is gay, or I know people, you know, like, it's all that crap. Like, it's more like, so this is what I'm hearing. Is that right? Thank you for sharing it with me. It's all about listening, not giving advice. It's all about seeing and validating who this person is. Being seen is huge, especially when you're coming out. Like, you, you were hiding for most of your life. So to be seen and accepted for who you are is huge. Hey, really quickly, if you like this content or if you don't like it, let me know down in the comments because your likes and comments are going to help me learn what you want more of. And then that way I can keep bringing you the good stuff. All right. Thanks so much for your feedback and back to the show. You see a lot of people online, again, healing, healing and trauma are two big buzzwords. Um, I'm healing, I'm healed, whatever. What are some of the misconceptions around healing when people maybe think yeah. they're healed, what are, what, and they, but they're really not? Like, what are some of the, the telltale signs that, no, you probably have a little bit more healing to go? Well, here's what I used to talk about permanent healing. I don't think it exists. I don't, I don't think, think so either. The thing is permanent healing. I think you're never done. You know, I think here's the way I think about it. When you work through something, you elevate your energy and you've released something that you carry. And then inevitably it's going to come up again. And then there's, you recover quicker and you learn something different hmm. and then you elevate again and then it'll come up again, but it's going to come up because you're in a different vibration. So you're interacting with it differently and you're learning something different and then you elevate again. You know, I, yeah, my dad was really narcissistic and I, 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 for years I was able, I was running away from narcissistic people and then I stopped running away, but I didn't, I was able to kind of, um, choose to not have people in my life who were harmful that way. And now what's happening recently. So boom, boom, boom. Now recently I'm actually speaking up to people who are narcissistic. I have a voice. I'm not running away and I'm not kicking them out of my life. I'm speaking up. I'm like, this isn't okay with me. And this is, you know, and so I can feel the elevation of me being around narcissistic people. Somebody's threatening me. Somebody in my field is kind of threatening me right now. If you do this, then I'm going to do that. You know, and I was in the past, I would have been terrified. Now I'm like, look, love and connection heals trauma not threats and attacks. I'm not going to succumb to that behavior. You do whatever you want. I'm going to be a kind person. And I'm not going to take that kind. I'm not going to make a decision based on fear. Mm -hmm. so I, I hear myself standing up. I'm not attacking, but I'm standing up with power and truth, with a voice, without fear. It feels really good, but it's, it's my evolution. I couldn't have done that two years ago. I couldn't have. I would have been had nightmares and worrying and figuring out how to do it differently. I'm like, no, I'm, I'm sick and fine. It's not okay. And I'm not going to be treated that way. And I'm going to let you know that. I couldn't do that before. 
Yeah, I feel like you have to just do it one time and right? see that it's not going to be the end of the world. I, I remember I used to be so afraid of my dad, not really afraid like he was yeah. going to harm me, but I was just a very obedient child. So whatever he said, I just took his gospel. This is what needed to happen. And then one right. day as a young adult, he asked me to do something um, that I wasn't really it wasn't aligned with my values. And I yeah. just said, no, I'm not going to do it. And he said, OK. And that was it. And it was like I could have said no all this time. Why and didn't I, anybody tell me my life could have been so much easier? That's exactly right. But that's the living. That's the doing it differently in life that I'm talking about as part of healing. You have to take those moments because they're scary and see that there's a different outcome now compared to what it was then when you were a little kid. So that, that's, yeah, those things, that those are hard to do, but I really encourage people to, to do that in life because it does make a difference. Well, a lot of times also with narcissistic, well, say people with narcissistic tendencies, you know, yeah. it's all about them. So they're just looking for a solution to whatever problem they have. And if you can't provide that solution, they just, they immediately go to someone else for that solution. So yeah. that's what I realized because my dad yeah. has a little bit of that, you know, yeah. tendency. Yeah. And, um, and he, it, I, I took it personally. Like, I, yeah. I guess I was thinking that he was thinking that he had invested more emotionally into me than I, than I thought. And it really wasn't that at all. It was just, he just saw me as a solution and I that rejected it. Yeah. And he just went somewhere else. And I was like, oh, that's how people with narcissistic tendencies are. They, it's not even personal. So yeah. yeah, that helped me a lot. That's great. That's really great. Yeah. Yeah. So um, I feel like this book is really, I mean, you just jump right in, right, to the story. So I feel like it's more of a supplement to your other work, the work yeah. that you've written on, on trauma. Is that what you thought when you when you sat down and wrote this book? Like, who did you have in mind as the audience, well, the people who I've are familiar with you? I wrote two books. One was for therapists to learn about this model of therapy called Internal Family Systems. It's working with the different parts of you. Second book was kind of my life's work professionally trauma, IFS, internal development systems, and neuroscience. And then, I, like, I do a lot of speaking. I do a lot of public speaking. And I always are, like, telling people I have a trauma history. Like, I, I want to break down the us and them. Oh, I'm the expert. You're the patient. I'm like, no, I have a trauma history. You have a trauma history. Like, let's even the playing field. And when the publisher recommended that I write a memoir, I thought, oh, I can help people heal through my story. Mm. Like it was, it was really about helping people heal in the general public. Because after I got that message, bring trauma healing to the world, I'm like, the world doesn't need another academic book. Mm -hmm. The world needs a story, mm -hmm. right? That, mm -hmm. and so I was like, I can help trauma healing through my story, right? And so that was felt really important to me. I didn't realize how much healing I would do <laughs> by writing a memoir, I was really writing it for people to learn that healing is possible, you know? Um, so yeah, I mean, it feels, it feels good. And, you know, I, my next book is going to be a book for the general public on how to heal and creating a program, as I said. Um, and my, the memoir is being turned into a movie, as I talked earlier. And for me, that's just a win-win because it's going to reach more people. And pe more people are going to know that healing is possible. This is not a story about trauma as much as it's a story about thriving and healing. And that's what I want people to know because I haven't had the, I had a bad trauma history. A lot of people have had worse than me and I'm right. aware of that. And I want them to know that healing is possible. And, and as someone who's, who writes, I'm assuming you write your own books. And mm -hmm. so you actually sat down and write your own story. Yeah. I, know, I know what that feels like, how, how yeah. sort of blurry eyed you can get, especially when you wrote three different versions of the book from right? all these different perspectives. It's like, you can't even really see what's, what's popping out the most. Cause all of it kind of is close to you. So what if, what, what has surprised you? What, what are people resonating with the most in, in the work? Because I tell you, the part that got my full attention was the, the get coming out stuff and being really? married. And yeah, it seems like that's where you really kind of, you know, you were, you were, um, I don't know, it just seemed more alive, that part of the book. Well, it's interesting. Everybody's, people relate to very different things. Like, it's really interesting. I love getting feedback from people. 
a lot of people like, oh my God, I had a childhood very similar to you. Oh my God, I've been in failed relationships, even though I wasn't gay. Oh my goodness, you know, I had a very similar uh, ending of my relationship with my parent when they died. You know what I mean? Every There's different people. These are like universal themes that people are relating to without going through the same thing that I went through. They're universal thing. I felt so excluded and felt like I needed to be somebody different than I was too. It wasn't gay. It was this, do you know what I mean? So like everybody has ways, different ways of relating to it, which is really awesome. What I'll tell you when I was writing it, it was like, I would wake up at three o'clock in the morning. My head was spinning with ideas and I'm like, I can't go back to free for months. I'd wake up at three o'clock in the morning, right, 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 right. And then I'd be, be nine o'clock. The kids would wake up at seven o'clock. The kids would wake up. I'd been writing for hours. They'd go to school and then I'd start my day at nine o'clock. Like it was this crazy, it was almost like the information was flowing through me. It was an, an incredible experience. And writing the last quarter of the book was in real time. My dad was sick and I was writing, like that was amazing to be like, get on the airplane, have this experience and right, 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 right. Like, so it was so alive because it wasn't a story in retrospect. You know what I mean? I was telling it as it was happening, which was very cool. But there, there isn't one, like, I love the fact that there isn't one place that most people are relating. It's a, it's a very different facets depending on what they've gone through, you know, I've had a divorce too, or blah, 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 like all, all different things. Raising my kids was super challenging. I have a special needs kid, like a lot of things people are relating to. And that, that's probably the most rewarding thing, honestly. Talk about the cover. Uh, I, I, I didn't like the cover that my publishers chose for me, but oh. whatever. Um, that's yeah. just, it's what it is. But, you know, this is an interesting cover. And, and the the yeah. font that they chose, the... You yeah. know, the starry night background talk, talk. I know, I know it wasn't arbitrary. So tell me, tell me about this. hundred percent. So I was so fortunate to have a, a really, a, a very qualified artist mm -hmm. agree to do the co cover art. So she was, I so was you cool. organized this or the publisher organized the artist? The publisher, we had a, we had a, a budget okay. and there's a friend of mine, Lori Gottlieb. Um, yeah, I know Lori. Who, you know, Lori, like maybe you should talk to someone. I'm like, Lori, I love your book cover. Who did your book cover? You know, and she's like, oh, this is the person who did it. So I reached out to her. She's like, let me see the book. She read it. And she's like, yeah, I'll do the cover. So I was really fortunate to have her. Um, and I loved looking at her website and seeing her work. And there was like eight different versions that she sent me. Um, I said, yeah, this is cool. Yeah, this is cool. Yeah, this is cool. And then at one point I said to her, um, how did it go? It was kind of like, I'm. Um, Oh, so I go to a, like a, a medium, like a spiritual person. And after my dad died, he showed up in, a, in one of these visits. And the, the, the medium person said, it's like he's sending stars down to you from the sky. Okay. It was a move and it just bro it broken down into tears. And I felt the love from him. Like he transitioned and I felt the love and it's as if he's sending stars down from the sky. And then this one, this cover showed up. She's like, I have a really cool idea. This was like the last cover she showed, she showed me. I have a, and she did the font is like, it's like, you know, a skydiver writing the font like that. So she's the one that kind of came up with this idea. And as soon as I saw it, I was like, yes. Here it is. And, and it was like my dad was is, is with me in every book that sold. You know what I mean? So it was so perfect. It was so, it's like when right is right. You know what I mean? It just landed. And I was like, yes, this is it. So it was I feel so like the dad, your dad co wrote the book with you through his actions. You know, he totally. Like did. That's a part of it. Totally did. Yes. Yeah. This is, that's why like dedicating it to him and my kids, it's like, this is our story. It's not just my story, mm -hmm. it's our story. So um, let's, let's suppose you live another 25, 30, 40 years and you go back to the spirit world. What do you imagine 
three lessons would have been from this lifetime known as Dr. Frank Anderson? Love and kindness matters. Family is more important than work. And helping others matters. Love it. That's what I would say. That's a great question. Beautiful. I think that's a good place to end it. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> what can you say after that, right? Done. It's a wrap. This is great. I really appreciated talking to you. This is a great conversation. You're a, you're a, I could feel your energy. You're a really great person and you're doing good things in the world, which is really awesome. So thank you for kind of having me on here and getting this message and your message out to the world because you're Thank making you, man. I was getting goosebumps like several times just hearing mm -hmm. hearing how you articulate your story and mm -hmm. um so yeah I'm glad that we were we were brought together I can't I remember agree. how but yeah I, I I don't know either and I agree with you and you know goosebumps for me are always like source energy saying yeah mm -hmm. you're mm -hmm. right where you need to be yep that's correct so I love that you have that experience also so the book is To Be Loved, A Story of Truth, Trauma, and Transformation. I love that subtitle, too. I know there's a story behind that, but we don't have time to get into that right now. <laughs> a Story of Truth, Trauma, and Transformation, a memoir. I love it. Frank G. Anderson, MD. Thank you, my friend. It's Thank you so much. Honor. Thank you. Thank you so much for watching. Just FYI, we post a new video almost every day. So make sure you comment and subscribe below so you don't miss out on anything. And if you enjoyed this video, I think you're really going to love this one as well. And if you ever want to see a playlist of all of my podcasts or all of the plot twists or any other category of videos, you can find links to those in the description below.